Open your Bibles up to Lamentations, and while you're finding your place there, I would like for all mothers to stand. We're going to show our appreciation, but right after, right after I say just a couple words, but every mother, I'd like for you to stand, please, and I want to say this, happy Mother's Day, and far, far, far too much attention is focused on Okay, and just in life in general, too much attention is focused on when we fail. We're always quick to point out the failure of somebody else, and we don't do we don't we don't do them justice by pointing out their successes. And uh, and I want to say thank you for what you for for being a mother. I have no idea what that's like, and and, and I mean that in all sincerity. The emotionalism that's part of it, of carrying a child, I was going to say for nine months, but it's not always nine months. And the, the bond, the bond of, bond of that, the bond of nursing a child, the, I just, I don't know anything about that. And guys, sometimes I think that we think we do. I think we, we got it all figured out. Well, we don't have that one figured out. And, and then how, just the way, and I'm going to talk about that this morning. From that point forward, the investment that a mother makes in a child, it's, it's irreplaceable. And God gave mothers to us and for, to, to, to fill a very specific, invaluable role. And uh, so I want to say this morning in all sincerity, thank you. Thank you, all mothers. Uh, for what you do, what you've always done, and what you still do, and what you mean to all of us. Let's give them all a round of applause. You may be seated. Lamentations, you're going to find it at the end of Jeremiah and at, at the beginning of Z Ezekiel. Just by five chapters, I think, right in that book, and uh, right in between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And I only have one verse to read for you this morning. Lamentations chapter 5, I should tell you that, chapter 5, in verse 16. Lamentations 5, 16. And this is going to seem like an odd verse to start off with, this, this a sermon about mothers, but follow along. You, it won't be long and you'll figure it out. But the crown has fallen from our head, woe unto us that we have sinned. The crown has fallen. And that little phrase there is a phrase that I want to use to, to get us into our sermon this morning. Um, the crown has fallen in our society. Now what that means here is that the crown had fallen from the head of Israel because of their rejection of God and their, their being God's chosen people. But I want to use that in, 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 in by way of introduction in explaining that the crown has fallen from motherhood, from the title of mother in our society and around the world. Uh, I'm going to make this statement now and I'll make it again at the end, but often often mothers in this day and age wear the crown uh, the crown of motherhood at, at like a like a thorn of crowns they 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 are trying everything they do to escape look as i said this week when i heard it on the radio that now it's pc is politically correct to say birthing people and it's insane but people are running from the title of mother when I feel like it's one of the greatest titles that somebody can possess. And I, and, and I would like this morning to say we need to pick that crown back up and put it in its place, the crown of motherhood. And, and our mothers, I want you to wear it proudly, and I don't mean in a pridefully way, but, but, but wear it uh, and fulfill the purpose of being a mother and, and the purpose and the power, the power that God gave to you and the influence that you have. What is the statement? Uh, uh, the hand that rocks the cradle is the one that rules the world or something like that. Every great person in history had a mother. And I know that all mothers aren't equal. I know there are great mothers and I know there are some mothers that are lacking. But probably those that are lacking probably had a mother that was lacking. 
and they, they just haven't figured it out. And, and look, instead of looking down in disdain at them, we should pray for them. Because a mother is a powerful, powerful figure. And our, and our mothers in this world need to stop trying to be fathers. And our fathers need to stop trying to be mothers. And when two women get together and, and, they, and they, they have a baby the way that scientifically can be done in this day and age, and they think they don't need a father. Absolutely wrong. And when two fathers, two, two men get together and think that they can have a baby and think that they can do just a job rearing that child without a mother, that's doubly wrong. I don't know. Look, I'm going to make a statement, and I don't even know if I believe it. So if, if you don't, I'll probably agree with you in about an hour from now. But sometimes I wonder... Sometimes I wonder if mothers, if mothers can raise a child by themselves better than fathers could raise that child by themselves. I don't know if I believe that because I believe that each role is given by God. And I believe that a complete home is going to have a father and a mother in it. I believe that. And I know, I know that's not always the case. And I know that things happen. And I know that people fail so bad sometimes that it, it, it's not possible. And I get that. I get all that. But I'm saying that wasn't God's intention. God intended for, for men to be fathers and for mothers to be mothers and those two together to raise those children. And today I want to talk about mothers, motherhood, as we celebrate mothers today. I believe that one of Satan's greatest attacks is going after mothers. I believe that mothers, um, I believe that they, I, I believe that they, you can see in history, I think you can see in culture, th that with the, with the degrading of mothers, so comes the degrading of a nation. There was a time, there was a time when men held their tongue around women, around mothers. He didn't cuss in front of a in front of a lady. Well, we know that's that's out the door. That calf's out the gate. And we also know that our in our country is worse for it. Men will live up to, they really will. Men will live up to the bar. And a lot of I'm not saying across the board, but you know what I'm saying. A lot of times men will try to live up to the bar that the, the mother sets in that home. Here's what other people say, and I'm going to tell you who made these statements, and I haven't looked up the people. And some of these people might not be good people, but I'll tell you what, they made a good statement about mothers. A mother is your first friend, your best friend, your, your forever friend. And that's what my daughter meant. And that's true, that's true of my wife to our children. A guy named Leroy Brownlow said, Mother is the heartbeat in the home, and without her there seems to be no heartthrob. Often mothers are the straw that stirs the drink in the home, if you understand that. What do we, hey, who gets together and plans the family outings? The guys don't do it. It's the moms. It's the moms that want to get everybody together on that Sunday afternoon for Mother's Day, and they plan all the outings. Somebody said, and a lady named Susan Gale said, Mothers are like glue. Even when you can't see them, they're still holding the family together. James E. Faust said, The influence of a mother in the lives of her children is beyond calculation. Somebody else made the statement, Motherhood is the exquisite inconvenience of being another person's everything. Now let that sink in. The exquisite inconvenience of being another person's everything. Here's another statement, unknown, who made it? A mother's hug lasts long after she lets go. And it does. There's a Jewish proverb that says, a mother understands what a child does not say. True. In the few minutes we have this morning, I'd like to, in moving forward, to establish once again and lift high the role of mother in our society. I'd like to encourage each mother here today to pick up the mantle of motherhood. Don't run from it. No matter what society says, 
Seems like mothers can't even be uh, in society. They can't be celebrated. They don't want to be. They don't want to be called mothers. They want to be called birthing people. They, they, the society wants to break that down, wants to destroy that. Satan wants to smash that title of motherhood. And we need to pick that mantle back up, ladies. Don't be afraid to be called a mother. And, and be proud of it. Proud in the Lord that he gave you the, the inconvenience of being a mother. God, several times in his word, uses the word mother to help explain uh, his feelings about us. Understand this. Everything that you and I are, everything that women and men are, is of God. And it is God. Now, God refers to himself in the masculine. You know, he, he does say, I am the Father, God the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Uh, uh, our Father, our Father, which art in heaven. He said, he, he identifies with the, with the, with the, with the masculine side but make no mistake everything that mothers are god is everything that men are god is and if you say to put it very simply are you saying god has women characteristics no i say that god that women have god characteristics that's the point it's not women and men it's god and every one of us in this room we make we we are we are to be a representative of his image men and women alike point number one I have four points a mother does not forget the fruit of her labor Isaiah 49 15 and 6 I'm sorry 14 and 15 says but Zion said the Lord hath forsaken me and my Lord hath forgotten me and God's answer to that is can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget, but God said, yet will I not forget thee. He identifies, God identifies with a mother there. And he says, no, a mother cannot forget about her child. There's not a man or, per, or, or a woman in this room that believes for a second that his or her mother has forgotten about them. You know, we read the story of the prodigal son, and the story tells us about how that um, the, the father would go out day by day looking for the son in his return. You know what I think that was all about? I think that was the mother saying, get your lazy carcass out there. And you get up on that hill and you climb that hill and you survey the land and you, you make sure I want to know when my son's coming back. I don't know that. It wouldn't surprise me, though, if, that, if a mother was saying, where's our son? Where's our son? Point number two. A mother is a source of the earthly, I'm sorry, a mother is a source of, of all earthly comfort. Isaiah 66, 13. As one, as one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. In other words, that's probably not worded right, but God says as a mother comforts her child, I will comfort you. So in saying that, that, that characteristic that a mother has, that's where, that's the same characteristic that God possesses, and that is the origination of all comfort. Mothers are a picture of God and their desire and ability to comfort a child. What would the world be like without mothers giving comfort to their children through life's ups and downs? And it is a sad state of a person when a person finds themselves without a mother that loves them. I would say outside of God, that person is probably hopeless. Even some of the most vile and wicked people in our history that have, that have done some of the hor most horrible things have a good remembrance of a mother. A mother. And sometimes it is the love of a mother and the comfort of a mother that keeps someone in line until they can get in line with God. It's that loving, comforting mother. 
I used to coach my son in uh, in in uh, baseball, summer league, summer league baseball. And I remember during one game he was he was coming home and he slid in the home plate. And his home plate kind of stuck up a little bit, and his cleat caught it, and it twisted and rolled his ankle over. And uh, so I saw it, and, and he was grabbing at his ankle, you know. And I'm like, get up. Get up, walk it off. <laughs> get up and walk it off. Well, he did. He got up, and he limped. And, I'm, and I watched him as he limped back to the bench thinking, that might be something more than just sprained ankle. But, uh, but that was, hey, I'm the coach, and I'm his dad. You get up and walk it off. And then my wife Brenda came to me <laughs> sometime later, not long later, but, honey, uh, I think we need to do something. I think your son broke his ankle. I'm like, really? Broke his ankle? And, and I looked back there, and he was just a young, he was a young kid, but, but he was back there and, and just still, you know, five minutes later, grimacing and holding his leg. Well, what did he get from his dad that day? Get up. Walk it off. Don't be laying around screaming like that. Uh, that's what the dad brings to the table. And you know what? That's not all bad. And guys, I'll talk about us in a month from now. <laughs> that's not all bad. I mean, now that can be abused. But, you know, dad's kind of set a bar for manhood and and, and, and uh, being strong. And so um, I won't say I totally regret it that day, but the mother is the one that comforted him, walked right over to him. And the mother is the one that said, I think we need to take him to the hospital. And we did, and he did break his ankle. <laughs> I was, because of my desire to live up to my father's high standard, you know, that for pain and strength. And I don't know, I was about my son's age, I think, when this happened. So, I, so, I mean, I was a very young teenager, if that. I might have been younger than that. But, and, and actually, my son wasn't a teenager then. He was, he was younger than a teenager when that happened to him. But I was riding on the tractor. We were up in the mountains of Virginia and uh, bailing hay. How many people's bailed hay? Yeah, you haven't lived until you bailed. Look at Sally's hands up. So we were bailing hay, and I, was, and I was riding, and we had a load, and we were driving back to the barn to unload it, and I was riding on the tongue where the tongue of the, of the wagon, you know, the flatbed, where it meets the tractor, and you put a pin through it there. Some of you that know what I'm talking about. And it's a loose joint. It, you know, it's, it's connected, but it's not tight, and it's loose. And I was standing back there near it, and my dad looked over his shoulder and says, now be careful. You keep, you don't, don't step on that place where they both join because they're bouncing back and forth. He said it'll, it'll, you know, might injure you. Oh, he didn't say the word injure. You'll probably get hurt. That's the way he would have said it. Sure enough, I'm back there, and I'm riding, and I'm holding on to the back of his seat, I think, but my foot got right on top of that place. And sure enough, it, it moved a certain way, and it pinched, and it cut the bottom of my foot. And I remember holding on, and I looked at my bottom of my foot, and it's bleeding just all over the place. Well, all I said to my dad, I poked my dad, yeah, I said, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head back to the house, which wasn't that far. I mean, a couple hundred yards. And uh, I said, I'm going to head back to the house, whatever. Uh, okay. So I jumped off. Now, I didn't tell my dad. I didn't tell my dad that I was hurting and I was fearful. And I remember limping back, kind of half jogging, limping on that foot, on the ball of my foot. And I got back to there and went right into the house and my mom was there. And I said, uh, you know, mom, hey, I'm crying. <laughs> Cut my foot. What happened? I told her. Did you tell your dad? No. No, I was looking for a mother's comfort. I wanted to be strong in my dad's eyes, but I needed my mother to pull me aside and pull me in and clean it up and to bandage it up and say it's going to be okay. Point number three. So that point number two is about the comfort, the comfort that a mother brings to a child. Point number three, a mother refuses to give up on the 
reconciliation of a wayward child. It kind of a little bit like point number one, but Luke 13, 34 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen, as a hen, so here again, the, the, the female, uh, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. My dad, I remember vividly the, the night that my dad got saved. My brother and I were out. If we were together, it probably meant that we were down in, in Kelowna Heights at the Sporting Goods store and buying some fishing gear or whatever, and that's probably what we were doing. And so we came home and walked, came in the house and started to walk down the hallway. And my dad and mom, uh, you know, uh, came out of the back bedroom and stopped us. And my dad right there said, well, I want you boys to know something. I got saved tonight. And at the time, I'm thinking, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Does that mean there was an ambulance here? Does that mean he was choking and he got somebody saved? I didn't know what it meant. But then as he talked, yeah, I got it. Because, see, at that time, we weren't going to church. And then I understood what he meant. What he meant was he got, he got saved, born again. And he said, now, <clears throat> he said, um, I want us to go together to church now on Sunday mornings. And my brother and I were teenagers. On Sunday mornings, I want us to go to church as a family together. He said, but if you, if you and your brother, if you two, you know, you, both of you, if you don't want to go, said, that's fine. And I remember in an instant thinking, that's not my dad to say, if you don't want to do what I want you to do, that, that'll be okay. So I thought, there's got to, you know, it's like Paul Harvey. What's the rest of the story? So he said, he said, that's fine. He said, but if you don't want to go to church and if you're not going to go to church on Sunday morning, he says, I'm going three times a week. I'm not going to go Sunday night. I'm going to go Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm not going to make you go, but you're going to go Sunday morning. And if you don't want to go, that's okay. But you can get your stuff together and you can move out. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Now, look, in my home, I didn't like, I didn't, I didn't melt. A little, oh, dad, just me. No, it was like, well, that's kind of the way it was in my house. And my dad loved me and my brother. I didn't freak out. I'm like, well, church sounds good to me, Dad. <laughs> and we went to church every Sunday morning. And two years later, I guess, a little late, a little, maybe I got saved and my brother got saved a little bit after that. Now, that's my dad. You can move out. You want to keep the rules? Then you can move out. I'm fine with that. I don't think that was my mother's opinion, though. I think that was dad talking. I, I, if I know my mom well, and I do, I believe that she was probably behind my dad, supporting my dad. And, I, you know, my dad, you know, my dad, uh, he, he, he led the home. And I think she was supporting his call, his use of words. But I think she was cringing inside uh, that maybe one of us might take my dad up on it. And no, we had more sense than that. A mother is always, is always there hoping, holding out hope. Dads are a whole lot quicker to say, get out. I mean, they just are. And you might say, I'd never say that to my child. Well, and that's fine. I mean, not saying that you should, not saying that you shouldn't. But dads are more often more quickly to say, pack your bags and leave than a mother is. A mother's going to be the one that says, no, no, let's give them another chance. I don't know how many times I got in trouble during the week. And my dad drove a truck across the road and he was gone all week long. He'd leave on Monday morning or Sunday night, Sunday night generally, and he'd get back Friday night or Saturday morning. He was gone all week long. So my mother, it was just my mother. And boy, I'd do something early in the, early in the week and I'm going to tell your dad when you get home. And, uh, well, early in the week, it was like, I didn't say this to my mom, but inside, I'm like, whatever. You know, hey, that's three or four days away. That's an eternity away. Well, the closer that it got toward the end of the week, now I'm like, you know, maybe she forgot. Thursday and Fridays, I was the best kid you ever met. And, and I will say that more times than not, my mom did not tell my dad. <laughs> because my mom just, because mothers... They just have that, that hope. Well, okay, I mean, it'll be better. You know, I think I got through. I mean, there's just a hope there that a mother has and that a mother needs to have. We have a picture of my son 
at the senior night of his on his senior year in basketball of senior night they celebrate parents on senior night and um, and after we're after the game I think it was after the game but uh, our son is standing between us and, and Brenda's putting a kiss on his cheek and I've got my fist held up to the other cheek and it's kind of like well there's our recipe right there it's 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 the it's the strength of the father and the and the bar and but it's the mother that's right there and if you're missing either one it's the child's going to struggle the child is going to struggle but as i said before sometimes i think that mothers do a better a better job of double duty than maybe a guy does than maybe a father does point number four a mother's love for a child is deep seated and consistent hosea Chapter 13 and verse 8 says, I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps and will rend the call of their heart. And there will I defend, or devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. But the first part there, what is one of the greatest, easiest ways to get killed out in the wilderness? That is to go up and mess with a cub. If you see a cub out in the wild, you need to be running the other way. You don't need to be walking up going, how cute. Yeah, that's going to be real cute because you're going to become supper for the mother and those two cubs in just a short while. Uh, mothers, that mother, that she bear does not tolerate that. My wife is, is similar to this. My wife used to say a lot. She doesn't say it as much anymore. But she used to say a lot that if you attack my children, I grow claws and fangs. And, and, and she says, I become this werewolf. And you know what? I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it happen. No, uh, again, now, now, I do think that, look, we all, we all know that any strength that you have can be a weakness if it's abused. It goes for every, every strength that you have can be a weakness if, uh, on the flip side of that if we're not careful. So being a werewolf, if you're not careful, can, can be, lead to some things that maybe it shouldn't. But, but I am saying, though, mothers are protective. They are. They are protective of their children. And, uh, and that's not a bad thing. Sometimes it seems, though, that mothers in society, and I've said this, I'm going to make the same quote now at the end, they, 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 they toss the crown of motherhood down. They just don't want... They don't want the attack of it. Uh, uh, hey, a, a, a stay-at-home mother, hard to do in this day and time. It's really hard to have one income and, and purchase a home and, and, and things like that. But, but nevertheless, there are st some that still do it. And sometimes people, mothers, sometimes ladies don't want to say that they're a stay-at-home mother. You know why? Because they'll be attacked. Yeah, I guess you're barefoot cooking cookies all day in the kitchen. No, no, and that, and that angers me to hear somebody say that. You know, it makes me want to be the werewolf. Come and rip your head off. No, that mother, the mother that is able to, should thank God that she's able to stay at home. And I see some in here now, and they shake in their head. You know why? Because being a mother. Now, and, and God bless the mothers that can't. But if you can, you wear that crown, wear that crown. Uh, proudly, if you understand what I mean, in thanks to God, stand up tall and don't worry about the, what the world's saying. Don't worry about that the world doesn't even want to call you a mother anymore. Don't worry about that the world says you ought to be. Don't you have any get up and go? Don't you have any desires in life? Don't you have any gumption? Don't you, don't you want a career too? You know what that is? Hey, Eve, look at the fruit. Sometimes you have to work. My wife worked. You know, my wife had to work. And there's a lot of you that had to work. I, and my hat really, really goes off to you too for working and maintaining what you do. But for those, for those that have the opportunity to stay at home, what a great thing. And you investing your full-time energy and resources into your children. Powerful. Powerful. I have a poem to read. 
It's a little bit lengthy, so hang with me, but it's called a mother's crown. And this actually is written to be read at a funeral. So if you notice that, it's, it's written to be read at a funeral, but I think that you'll get everything that it's saying. And I would like to challenge the mothers that are in this room today and that are watching out there by way of live stream or might, might watch this later. I'd like to challenge you to pick up that crown and wear it. A mother's crown. Heaven lit up with a mighty presence as angels all looked down. Today the Lord was placing the jewels into my mother's crown. He held up a golden crown as my darling mother looked on. He said in, this gen in his gentle voice, I will now explain each one. The first gem, he said, is a ruby. And it's for endurance alone. For all the nights you waited up for your children to come home. For all the nights by their bedside, you stayed till the fever went down. For nursing every little wound, I add this ruby to your crown. An emerald I'll place by the ruby for leading your child in the right way. For teaching them the lessons that made them who they are today. For all, always being right there through all life's important events, I give you a sapphire stone for the time and love you spent. For untying the strings that held them when they grew up and left home, I give you this one for courage. Then the Lord added a garnet stone. I'll place a stone for amethyst, he said, for all the times you spent on your knees when you asked if I'd take care of your children and then for having faith in me. I have a pearl for every sacrifice that you made without them knowing, for all the times you went without to keep them happy, healthy, and growing. And last of all, I have a diamond, the greatest one of all, for sharing unconditional love, whether they were big or small. It was your love that helped them grow, feeling safe and happy and proud, a love so strong and pure it could shift the darkest cloud. After the Lord placed the last jewel in, he said, your crown is now complete. You've earned your place in heaven with your children at your feet. I'm not saying that everything in that poem is actually doctrinally sound, but I think that you get what we're saying here. Mothers are special. And guys, we can't be what a mother is. We don't have any hope of, and God, but God made it that way. No, mothers, be a mother. Children in here today, respect your mother. Honor your mother. Bring happiness and joy to your mother for this kind of life that they lived. To bring you into this world, to protect you, to teach you, to help mold and make you. It's the tool that God often uses to mold and make his small children. Is a mother. I celebrate you. I celebrate you today. I take my hat off. And I honor you. I honor you. Uh, and I honor all of motherhood today. Let's pray.